Equity in governance is based on a fundamental human rights principle that promotes fairness, inclusion, equal opportunities, and access for all citizens, regardless of their gender or disability. Welcome to the Leading Woman Show Governance Series, brought to you by our sponsors, the National Endowment for Democracy and Luminate. My name is Abosede Jojagan, and today we will discuss equity in governance. McKinsey Global Institute estimates that advancing women's equality in Nigeria could add $229 billion to the country's GDP by 2025. By fostering gender equity in governance, Nigeria can tap into the full potential of its diverse talent pool, make more informed policy decisions, and create a society where opportunities and benefits are distributed fairly. Now, joining us on this episode as guests to explore the systematic barriers that have hindered progress for underrepresented groups, especially women and youth is Nafisa Atiku Adejuan, a Walter Carrington Fellow and the Program Officer Gender Justice at the Shewu Musayi Ardwa Foundation. Our next guest is Honorable Sheyi Adisa, who served as a member of the Oyo State House of Assembly from 2019 to 2023, where he represented the Afijo State constituency. He's also the immediate past principal private secretary to the governor of Oyo State. And our final guest is Kunle Lawal. He's the executive director of Electoral College Nigeria. He's also an entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, and patriot. He considers his boundaries to be limitless and is focused on changing the Nigerian narrative in political participation. Now with this lineup of guests, I'm sure you cannot wait for us to dive into the conversation. But before then, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. I'm really delighted to have our guests in the studio today, and we are talking about equity in governance. So, Shay, I want to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> right. How do you define and measure equity in governance? All right. Um, when I think about equity, I think about um, appropriate representation. Mm. Um, if we say the population of Nigeria is 52 male, 48 female, what is equitable for me is that representation should mirror that same um, population ratio. Mm. Uh, we know that's not the case, but in the ideal world, I believe that is what is supposed to be. Mm. Um, we're not... Uh, so there's a difference between equality and equity. Mm. Equity is saying that this is the right uh, thing and we're trying to achieve that. So for me, equity is, is um, representing or mirroring the people that we're here to represent. If the whole purpose of governance is um, a select few people representing everybody, mm. then the proportion or the ratio should also be similar. We're talking about 5% women, 2%, and yet we have a population of easily maybe 50% of our population being women. Exactly. So absolutely uh, not, not equitable not, at all. Not acceptable. Yes. If you said, let me come to you. How do you define or measure equity in governance? Hmm. Wow, well, that's, that's an interesting question. So my perspective is a bit different. Mm you know, when it comes to gender equity and then we're talking about gender equality. Mm. So how I like to think about equity is that it is the tool basically used to achieve gender equality. 
So equity is very, how do I put it? It's a very um, critical framework when it comes to interrogating these things. It mm. chooses to interrogate by nature. Mm. So it doesn't just say, you know, we need to have women in governance. Mm. It says, how can we achieve more representation for women in governance, looking at their unique dynamics, right. right? And tailoring very specific solutions. So the end goal is that we want everyone, we want people to be represented, but how do we get them there? Right. How do their different social, um, social economic backgrounds, you know, affect them from getting to this place? What about their historical backgrounds? What about the economic backgrounds? What about their tribal differences, mm. ETC? Mm. How do those nuances play into our, you know, play into um, getting to our goal, right? So equity takes into consideration all those things. It, it interrogates all those things and it designs solutions, right, for specific people as against putting a blanket solution mm. on we need women in governance. So, you know, let's, let's give every woman a free form mm. to contest. Mm. It, that's not what equity is. It interrogates the situation and says that this is what we need to do to get through there right. because... You want to run for office. I want to run for office. But you're probably going to need something a bit, like a different package from right. what I need. Right. And equity takes that into consideration. consideration. So it doesn't just say, um, you know, we have a certain number of people in governance already. It asks questions. It right. says we need to get more people involved. But how do we get them involved to a level that is logical, right. that is holistic? Right. Yeah, so that's so, it So, Hule... Wow, I think I'm... <laughs> I'm going How do you define and measure equity in governance? Okay, I'm going to, since everybody decided to take a different <laughs> path, I would borrow my predecessors and decide to take a different path. So for me, <clears throat> equality in governance can only be achieved in what you would say in economics a perfect market, which is almost clearly almost impossible. Mm. So since we can't achieve the impossibility, now how are we going to use what we determine equity, mm. that which is, for, for me, equity relies on the quality of factors, not mm. exactly the number. Right. So I, we, it's been proved with time that the more we women you have in legislature doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have more gender-based laws. Mm -hmm. We need the quality of women that understand these things. So how do we assist this kind of women mm -hmm. in the legislature to ensure those kind of women can pass through the political process and make it to success? Right. So how do you expect to help them? I look at equity in governance as, okay, these women are capable. We've spotted them. They have their hearts in the right places. Right. They have the necessary knowledge. How do we assist them to break the, the problems which I feel they will face, which are to agree, um, political party bias, mm -hmm. and some other et cetera, mm -hmm. finances maybe yeah. in politics. Yeah. And for me, that is how you use equity to achieve equality That's in it. governance. Nafisa, what are some of the key barriers to achieving gender equity when it comes to decision-making and leadership? W what are some of the barriers that exist? Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think the first barrier for me and, you know, across board is a lack of understanding of what equity really mm. means. Mm. So a lot of people don't really understand the fundamental basics of the, the term equity and mm. what it seeks to achieve and yeah. what it will take to achieve. Mm. So it's more of, it's more or less like a technical knowledge gap in the first place. Mm. Believe it or not, equity in governance is something that a lot of people are still trying to get used to. You know, there's gender equality. And to be honest, once you enter a room and you shout gender equality, they're like, no, yes, women want to take everything. And, you know, we don't want to hear about gender equality. And then when you now say, okay, you know what, we, we want equity. And they start saying, uh -huh, yeah, that sounds a bit better. I know because I just went to a conference and, you know, that was the reaction in the room. But they don't understand that. Equity is on the road towards achieving equality. equality. So it's like there is a there needs to be like a sense of you know technical knowledge. Um, you need awareness. to close the technical yeah, so you, knowledge yeah, you gap. Need to, yeah, you need to close that gap so that mm. people really understand what it entails, and yeah. we can actually work towards, towards it. Towards so I think that's a really, really, really key because when you don't even know what equity is, you don't even have the skills to put it into practice mm. or the frameworks exactly. or the structures. 
So that's a huge knowledge gap that we have, not just in our public sector, but also in our private sector, and even sometimes in the CSO space. Right. You know, one of the things I like the way that you framed is, so it's almost like you're saying, I, I don't want the end result, mm -hmm. but I want something, it sounds, this one sounds like we should give it to you. Yes. You should take it. Now, she, you, you described earlier that, for example, government should yes. be a representation of the people it serves. Yes. Now, in Nigeria, we have men, women, and people with disability. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because that's one group yeah. that we usually, you know, ignore sure. yeah. and neglect. Sure. And as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, so if they represent 3.1% of the total population, yes. ideally, they should be represented at the highest level of government yes. at 3.1%. What are some of the barriers also taking into consideration this group of people? Because even with women, yes. we have another layer of women which are women who are who have disability sure. right mm -hmm. women who are with disability. so that's an and uh, as you know it's triple jeopardy i yeah. guess in that case so what would you say how do we really at, you know attack this or address these barriers all right so the first thing for me you know um when you talk about barriers some are self-imposed mm -hmm. um some people do not believe they deserve to be there. Mm. Uh, some people do not believe they can even get there. Mm. And so when you are fighting yourself, your thoughts, it's almost an impossible thing. And so the first thing for me, the first barrier is self. Mm. Um, people have say imposter syndrome, all of those things. If someone doesn't believe they deserve to be in office or that they can lead and govern, then there's not much you're going to be able to do to assist them. I think, um, and, and so in that regard, how do you solve that? We need to start to highlight and showcase women that are doing excellently uh, well in governance. We need to celebrate them so as to elevate you know, their status and then more people can believe that if she can do it, I can do it. Sure. So that's a way to, to solve that, that barrier, as mm -hmm. it were, that, that I'm not enough. We also have several other factors why, why, why um, we have these limitations, as it were. Um, economics, as it were, um, it has been uh, told in the past that you know, uh, women and maybe even people with disabilities do not earn as much. And so when you have those sort of barriers, um, we have to find ways to, to, to tackle that. So whether it's through external support um, and so on and so forth. We have tradition. Um, culture, mm -hmm. when they say women are not, a woman cannot lead me, mm -hmm. a woman cannot lead me. Mm -hmm. And you find that particularly at the grassroots, which is the base of political structures. Mm -hmm. And politics is what leads to governance. Yeah. And so when you have those sort of systems where they say, this woman, you know, and, and so, so those are the barriers that women face and they face them from a very young age so that they don't, you know, it's almost psychological that it's, it's not for people like us, mm. you know? So when you have culture, you have tradition, you have these economics, you have the system itself is not for women. Mm. And if you're mm. going to change the system and you have a patriarchal system, you have a male dominated system, um, it means even in the parties, right. even in, in, in the government itself, mm -hmm. all of those policies, all of the things they do, will not support women. It would act against, against. Yeah. these marginalized groups. Yes. Kule, before we go on a break, what would you add to that? How can we sort of address these barriers that exist and are preventing us from achieving equity in governance? I think what is most key to um, achieving equity, mm. I don't believe it can be achieved without justice. Mm. So the first has to be justice. And for there to be justice it means that policies need to be implemented entirely. Mm -hmm. It needs to first be a growing ground, policy-wise, right. for people living with disabilities and for women. Then we can start to have the conversations to break into political parties. I, have, I am of the notion, maybe haven't been in a political party, that there are even some, some political party positions that subjugate the powers of women. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't see the essence of 
a female woman leader in a party. Really, we don't have a male leader. What, why do you subjugate women and youth to being people that need to lead and then you use them to, to get men into power? Mm. No, no man has ever gotten in, into power without the support of women. And, you know, like he said, you also need to erase that cultural background mm -hmm. where they, they've grown to think that they, are only, they only exist to get men into power. Mm -hmm. Exist, I believe if any woman goes for any position in this, in this country, with women behind her, she has won the election. Mm -hmm. Man can only have run for office before, and I know what the support of a woman means. That, that's what I think. Brilliant. That is a good place to take a break, and we'll continue the conversation when we get back. Welcome back. We're still talking about equity in governance. So, Shaye, I want to come to you. How does equity in governance actually lead to better decision making and improved policy outcomes? Because we need to make it clear that we're not just saying equity in governance for equity in governance sake. First of all, the reason why we need equity is because we make better decisions. Mm. Mm. We make informed um, decisions because everybody has a say on the table. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's a unfortunate case mm. where you only have a section of society making decision. Mm -hmm. Wherever it is, it's unfortunate. Mm. Um, because you miss out on the qualities of the other parts that are not represented. Mm. You miss out on their wisdom. You miss, that, miss out on their experiences. You miss out mm -hmm. on... So they are, by just disqualifying them or not letting them be on that table, you have missed out on a lot of knowledge and wisdom that would help the decision-making progress. I'll tell you a story. You know, I'm a lawmaker, and um, part of what we do, we do, we do programs um, for, for people in the constituency. And there was a day my wife asked me, and she said, I, 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 want, to do, I want to do something for, for young girls in, in secondary school. I want to do padded drive. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to give sanitary pads. And I thought, wow, what a fantastic idea. <laughs> The only problem is I would never have thought about it. Absolutely yeah. not. I will never have thought about it. But, but, but when she showed me the stats mm. that it prevents girls going to school. Yes, you know, so Yes, yeah, see. And, and, you know, and, and when she showed me all the stats, I was like, ah, ha, I, I, it's just not, not a radar. natural decision for me to, to take. Mm. But because she was involved in my, you know, in me in office, and so we ran that project and it was excellent. It, wow. it was fantastic. But again, I would have missed out mm. if, you know, I didn't have that impute right. into my... And that's just a, a, a very straightforward example. And if we look around the world, during COVID, the countries that were led by women did better. Mm. When I say better, there were less deaths. They, they shut down quicker. Mm. Finland, mm. New Zealand, Germany... Yep. They were, they were led, by, and they were led by women. And so things like empathy, compassion, yes. um, these are skill sets or, 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 if you like, attitudes that are not common attributes of men, yes. but women carry. Yes. And they carry it even in their decision-making processes. So, so I think, you know, and even um, when you're thinking people with disability, it's some of the challenges they face. If you don't have those um, challenges, you may not think about it. It's true. Imagine trying to get into a building and you did not put a place for a wheelchair yeah. just because you did not think about it. Because well, you well, don't well, need you one. Do, yes, because you don't need one. Yeah. But it's, it's unfair mm. for people that have to use it and not be considered in the decision-making process. So I think we miss out a lot when we don't bring everybody to the table. Absolutely. And when you bring everybody, you get better decisions, better quality uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. So, Kule, you know, how, how can we leverage equity in governance? for better, you know, when you look al around us in Nigeria, for example, people say there's so much suffering, you know, there's so much, how can we leverage equity in governance? I mean, the, the stats that I shared earlier, 229 billion is what we're leaving on the table if we don't achieve equity in governance by 2025. Is this not for our collective good? And how do we tell everybody that, look, our life go better, if we actually achieve this thing? You know, there was a time uh, people were hung for saying the world was round. Mm. 
And somewhere down the line, everybody got to believe the world was round. And when we knew the world was round, man eventually found out he could fly. Mm. So it's the same with equity in governance. The culture within Africa and Nigeria being is that women cannot handle leadership positions. But when the stats say inclusion is going to drive better uh, governance yeah. and drive financial economy, mm -hmm. most people want to argue. But I'll cite, listen, I'll use an example or analogy to explain what I'm, I'm saying. So um, we're having a discussion in Abuja. I just got back from Abuja. And we're talking about new laws. And there was, a, there was a lady in the room. And, you know, we're sitting down with someone who's in the House of Rep. And, I, you know, I was, I was talking about uh, new uh, laws that could be put in. And we're just, you know, running things across. And I just turned to her and I said, what's your single most, what's your single biggest problem? Mm. She said, Kole, I'm a mom. I said, yeah, what's your single most biggest problem? She said, when I come back from... For when I when I just had I just had my baby not too long and I came back to work, mm -hmm. the fact that my baby was far away from me was mm -hmm. an issue. The moment she said that, my brain went into action, and guess what I told I, we, and I wrote something on it and I hope it gets passed with something we are pushing forward at the Federal House of Rep, and it was it was simple to mandate every workplace, private or public, mm -hmm. to have a room for caregivers for mothers returning after pregnancy. Simple. It could be transformative. Trans mm -hmm. And now this enhances, and from what she just said, I could already project it, it enhances the productivity of these women yes. knowing that their babies are just down the mm -hmm. hall yeah. instead of 30 minutes away somewhere yes. in Gariki or in, mm -hmm. in a Korodu or somewhere else away from them. It enhances their productivity. That is already telling you that you can get 25% more from your workforce without increasing your workforce. Mm. So I understand the statistics in the figures, and I think this, this is a new way to channel, because if, if they are more productive, Nigeria has all to gain for it. So why are we not leveraging on so much access in which we could, we could have this kind of conversation? Nafisa, as you're hearing that, what are you thinking? And of course, I saw you nodding to the mother, to the mother, because <laughs> that's something I'm sure that you can relate with. But how, how can we really just drive this message of equity in governance, you know, means better decision making and policy outcomes for all of us? Oh no, it's 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 really important. Equity in governance, driving policy, driving you know positive policies for everyone. Yeah. Um, but I would like to you know backtrack a little bit. Remember when I said that when you walk into a room and you say gender equality, and everybody says, "Hey, no, yeah. you're here to you're threatening us. Yes. No, can't do that. We want to take over, right?" And then you say gender equity, and they say, "Okay, maybe we can deal with it." But by the time we start getting into the roots, and they say, hmm, "This is beginning to look like what we said that we don't want in the yeah. first place," right? We need to move the conversation, to, and it was a conversation I was having with Honorable Shea Yadisa, mm -hmm. that we need to start framing the conversation in a way that it's not just good for the women, but it's also good for the men as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Because if there's anything that any single person responds to, even before you learn how to go to school or anything, it's your own self-preservation and self-interest. Right. So how mm -hmm. do we make people's self-interest in terms of equity and governance? Come, ham, how do we harmonize this interest together and make sure that, okay, we're on the same table as regards this, so let's work together. Because honestly, even about the um, development indices of economics and healthcare and ETC, even really down to peacekeeping, yes. conflict and mediation, yes. there is a growing body of work and evidence that supports that more women in politics, right, would lead to less conflict around, you know, election periods and yes. ETC. There is a really strong correlation between that and it's something that we've been working at in the, in the foundation in Kano and we're seeing that very strongly. Mm. So it's, it's, it's any person that basically is logical and critical thinking would understand these indices and would say, yes, equity in governance is important because then you adopt um, different people with diverse experiences, diverse expectations. But we all need to understand the country in which we're in and the context of the kind of leaders we have in Nigeria. There is the idealistic and then there is the realistic. <laughs> yes, it's the truth. So how do we marry those two worlds mm -hmm. to achieve what we want to do? Absolutely. We need to think about our strategies and methods, how we push forward these issues of equity and governance. So the people who are responsible at this moment for making those laws, yes. the lawmakers, 
that are in power? How do we make sure that our interests and their interests at least align at some point and makes sense to them, even though it might not be logical for us on the other side, but yeah. makes sense to everyone in the room. Yeah. So that's it for me. So Shay, how do we build solidarity mm. using an intersectional lens to promote equity in governance? And what does that mean? It means I'm female, mm. right? How do I build solidarity or how do I encourage solidarity from the men? I'm female and I may not be able to relate to your challenges and this feeling of I want to take over, right? How do I relate with the person living with disability even though I'm not them? So how do we really build solidarity amongst all the groups, the young people, mm -hmm. right? How do we bring everybody together? Male, female, young, persons with disabilities who are members of society, build solidarity to promote equity in governance. And not just me, I'm female, so I'm fighting for only females, yeah. right? Or I'm a person with disability, so I'm only fighting for people with disability without that intersectional lens. Okay, let, let me, let me I, as you're talking, I actually, uh, you know, I will first of all talk about the same gender before I, I, I take it to the other gender. You know, in the House of Assembly, we had just one woman out of 32. <sighs> um, and when she was sharing her story, we had a forum together. She said she had more enemies as women than supporters. So she had more opposition from women. Mm. It's almost as if if we can't go forward, you will not go forward. Mm. Um, and, and I thought that's strange. Maybe it's just her experience. Maybe we need to do some research because I, I, I'm sure there are also women that have gone into office just because more women supported them, mm. you know? Um, and, and I think this, this, the, the, there are some interesting conversations to have around that. Um, and, and even as a government, I have seen that, um, yes, you need to build allies and you need to build relationships, but there needs to be, a, 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 and not to downplay that, there needs to be a women supporting women. The first ladies, for example, they have a lot of power. And I ask, what do they do with it? Mm. How much of it do they, you know, really bring up the, the, this gender issue that, mm. look, the women we have, they're just not enough. Mm. You're not able to, you know, drive real good decision making if you have just one on the table and two. No matter how good they are, they're still going to have to face, um, you know, popularity or a numbers game yeah. um, at the end of it. So I think that's, that's by the side. But I think we need to try and see the, um, you know, the, the other side. Mm. And that requires a lot of education. Mm. That requires a lot of, um, you know, helping people to, you know, put the, themselves in the shoes of the other. Mm. Um, it's, is it easy? No, especially when we're all competing for the, you know, the same seats <laughs> as it were. But I think it's something we need to start early. Mm. I think it's something whereby we need to, and, and even raising children, you know, you're a boy, you're a girl. We're already making it obvious. A boy shouldn't do that. A girl shouldn't do that. And so when they grow up, they have exactly the same thing. You can't come here. You shouldn't be this. Mm. And so this education, this culture, I think it needs to maybe even start earlier if we're going to have those synergies or those uh, collaborations mm. when we get into office. You know, I have a daughter and I, I always say it everywhere. I cannot imagine anybody will discriminate against her just because she's a girl. Mm. I, I, it's, it makes no sense. Mm. So I think right from um, the, the, the younger days, we need to do a lot of work mm. in helping us see that, you know, together we can achieve more, yeah. collaborate, not compete, yes. really. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, in our education, in all of those things, it, 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 it it puts a framing or a mindset mm. so that when we actually do get into office or, or are in that space whereby we can make decisions, then we, we, we are not fighting anybody. Exactly. We're finding how to get the best solution working together. So I think right from a young age, we need to start um, those. That those starts things. shaping the mindset. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Kunle, what would you add to that? How do we build solidarity with intersectional lens to promote equity in governance? I think... The first thing we need to sell is that good governance 
does not have maybe a tribe, mm. gender, as someone added for me earlier, a religion. That's the first thing we need to sell. Because if you, if you notice, we look at good governance from the perspective of gender. Mm. We feel women might not deliver. We feel, now, have there been women in governance that did not deliver? Yes, but have there been men that in governance that did not deliver? Yes, yes also. <laughs> so you can't, you can't say, okay, when we give a woman the chance, what did she do? Okay, the, the list of guys that were given the chance actually supersedes the number of women. So we need to build first that, and I think that can only be done by education. And I also think there should be more collaboration between both genders. We're not, nobody's at war. Like the officer rightly said, we should appeal to self-preservation. Mm. And that self-preservation covers you whether you're male or female. So I think we should be able to have these conversations on how things can be done, appealing to both the preservation of both genders and not try to make it look like, okay, this, is, this side is taking power or you are losing power. Let it be we are all gaining power when we are all included together. Mm. I think that is the best way we could achieve this. Mm. And I think one of the key things that would help drive this most yeah. would be we need to start to sell ideological ideas in Nigeria. Mm. If we are able to do that, we would defeat the usual thuggery or whatever that annexes women out of politics. So if we're able to defeat that, more women will come out more women will participate. If you notice, places where women have had access to political power are where there were less class, more back shows. Mm. I, I know my gender is guilty of it. So I think we should be able to clear that out. No, I, I appreciate what you share there because really, ultimately, when you create space and you show people that this collaboration is possible, then they see it. Because what's happening is we haven't seen it play out. Mm. And so in our minds, there's a blocker to say it's not possible. But Nafisa, what will be your thoughts on how we build solidarity with an intersectional lens to promote equity in governance and not just young people fighting for only themselves, mm -hmm. you know, women fighting for only themselves? Sure. Everyone's working in silos. Mm. Okay, so I think first things first, we need to acknowledge the intersectionality that exists mm. and you know, understand that everyone is different mm. and also celebrate those differences. Like, for example, women are not um, homogeneous, we're heterogeneous. That's true. So there's a lot of women in politics that goes on, women in politics, women in politics, but even in the women in politics, there are different caucuses. There are the Absolutely. young women whose challenges are unique and different, and then there are the older crop of women whose challenges are also unique and different. That's Right. right. So there's there are a lot of different no, lines it. running across. So we need to, if I say interrogate, understand, highlight and celebrate these differences that mm -hmm. run across the different silos that exist. And, you know, I will always say this not too young to run did incredible work. They did, and they knew how to, it was a long campaign, yes. but they knew how to harness everyone on that one roof. Absolutely. However, they did it. <laughs> we don't want to we need a case study. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need to do like a case study, but it's something worth emulating, especially since they've launched the campaign for the five gender bills. Different women groups came together. So it's something that we need to interrogate the strategies that they use and how we can replicate that and even build up on that. Yeah. And then I think we all need to come to the point it's not a you versus me fight like has been echoed by the panelists in the room, right? Yeah. It's if it affects you, it affects me, mm. right? We need to understand that. The, it's an intersectional thing, yeah. right? So the lines that might cut across you might also cut across me. When I'm male or when I'm female and he's male, young or old, whatever, yes. Yes. the same thing might cut across each and every one of us. Yeah. Like poverty. And yeah, like, like poverty. You know. <laughs> no, true. It and doesn't choose, does it? It, it doesn't choose. No, it, doesn't. it doesn't choose. Or your religion yes. or, you know, your tribe no. or no. whatever it no. is. But so we by the time all we, suffer together. Yeah, we all suffer together. Yeah. Dollar rate does not discriminate. No, it doesn't discriminate. <laughs> so yes. when we begin to understand that <laughs> it's better we all come together before every, before you know everybody perishes. Because yeah. if we perish, everybody will enter into the same hole. Right. Oh, then we awesome. now start, I think we then start to, you know, move mm. even 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 if as we long term partners, at least let us move forward together. Let us move forward together. So we're wrapping up. Final thoughts on how we achieve 
equity in governance. I mean, we've said a lot here mm. today, but if there's one thing somebody who's watching can do, what would you say? Well, let's start with I, I, I think we should appreciate that, uh, you know, it's not just about us. Mm. You know, um, there are other people that matter mm. and we must work together for the issues we're trying to solve. All right, whether it's underdevelopment, poverty, whatever it is, mm. um, we need to get off our, this our high us, it's just about us. No, the, the enemy is not the other gender or the enemy is not the other, the enemy are the issues, the enemy right. are the, the problems. And we have that in common. And we have that in common. Right. And, and, and so how do I understand my strengths and limitations and appreciate the strength that my, the other person has? whether with disability, whether the other gender, whatever it is, and what he brings to the table. Yeah. It is when I start to see the, the, the strengths others bring, then I understand that it, the equitable thing to do is to collaborate and, and yes. face the challenges mm -hmm. we, we have. Thank you so much. Kune, I think I don't think we can achieve full equity in government if we do not first love a country. Mm. We must first love a country and we must always put that country first. When we start to put that country first, we will fall in love with the idea that everybody is needed on this journey to move forward. We critically need to always remember that Nigeria is the most populous black nation. And if Nigeria fails, the entire black race fails. Mm -hmm. And that means we all need to work together. Black women, black men, all of us need to work together for a greater country. I think that's what's most key. Fantastic. Nafisa, final thoughts? It's easy to say let's start including people, mm -hmm. right, in mm -hmm. discussions and then go ahead to start making plans for those other people that mm -hmm. are not included without mm -hmm. actually including them in the planning process. Mm -hmm. So please, above all, when we then say have this bright idea, hey, we need to include other people, please go ahead and call the other people to, to, the, come table to the table <laughs> and then start planning and making the policies together. As against you sitting down and saying we are making policies for people living with disabilities or are making policies for young women, but you don't have any young women. So you are trying to practice the equity without doing the equity. The equity. Mm. So not just talking the talk, but actually walking, walking the, the walk. Talk. Well, on that note, we're going to end this episode, but we'll take a short break and I'll come back and thank our guests. We'll be right back. On this note, I'd like to thank our distinguished guests for joining us on today's episode. We thank Nafisa Atiku Adejumo, Honorable Sheyi Adisa, and Kunle Lawal. We appreciate you for being a part of today's episode. And to our live audience, you have been simply amazing. To our viewers watching today's episode, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us across all social media platforms at Will and Global. Please like, share, and leave us a comment. And of course, remember that women's leadership can change everything everywhere. See you next week. <laughs>